Hello and welcome to Glasgow Doors Open Day's Digital Festival. This event will begin soon, but first we have a brief housekeeping message. So that you can get the most out of this session, we'd like to point out a few features of Zoom. By clicking on the buttons at the bottom of the Zoom window, you will be able to access the chat room, and if you are in a webinar, you will also be able to make use of the Q&A function. The Q&A function is so that you can ask specific questions of the speaker, which they will be able to answer time allowing at the end of the session. Use the chat room to contribute more generally to the discussion or to share links and resources. When using these features, please mind your P's and Q's. Both will be monitored and recorded. Most sessions will be recorded and uploaded to Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival YouTube channel and website. If you're in a meeting, please make sure you keep your microphone on mute unless otherwise directed by the host. If for some reason the session ends unexpectedly or you lose connection, please just click the link again and wait to be let back in. Similarly, if the host loses connection, please bear with us. We will do our best to manage any connection issues as and when they occur and may contact you by email if necessary. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear about your experience of our digital festival. Fill out our survey to be in with a chance of winning a prize. Our survey is available at www.glasgowdoorsopendaysfestival.org.uk forward slash survey. We hope you enjoy this event. Hello everybody and uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm just going to start sharing my screen with you now. So thank you very much for joining us and uh, thank you to Glasgow's uh, Doors Open Days for the, for the opportunity for us to, to give this talk. It's called The Secret Menagerie, and it's uh, about the recording of the Glasgow uh, Market Cross. It's going to be presented by myself, Stuart Jeffrey, along with uh, my uh, colleagues and ex-students, Grant Barnhart, Agnes Kenner, James McIver, Lizzie Wilkerson, and Stuart Perry. And the, the entire presentation relates to work that was undertaken by the School of Simulation and Visualization of Glasgow School of Art uh, as part of our a master's in heritage visualization. So this was a project work that was undertaken in, in stage two, which is the early part of uh, this year. Uh, and it is around uh, the recording of, of buildings and heritage sites. Uh, and we were very pleased that uh, Glasgow Buildings Preservation Trust through the good offices of Ingrid Shearer uh, allowed us access to the market uh, cross for this recording exercise. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, a number of projects were uh, uh, disrupted earlier on this year because of uh, COVID and the, the global pandemic. Um, so what we're going to, including of course Glasgow's Doors Open Day, which is why we have this digital version of it. So what we're intending to do um, is, is give you a rundown both of the project as it actually happened, given the constraints that took place uh, in the recording process, and also Perry's going to give you an insight into what the larger project was intended to, to actually look like. So the structure, um, after an introduction by myself, Stuart Jeffrey, thanks to Ingrid Shearer and Mike Marriott of, uh, of the GSE, uh, the structure of the talk is that we will have um, a little input on the, on the background to the building, the history of the building, our plan for presenting it to a wider audience, and Perry Stewart's going to be undertaking that, Lizzie Wilberson is going to be talking about the external photogrammetry around the building. I'll talk very briefly uh, about photogrammetry uh, in a moment. 
Uh, Grant Barnhart is going to talk about the interior of the building. And finally, Agnes Kenner is going to talk about the secret menagerie, i.e. this group of animals that actually live inside this building, which uh, uh, unfortunately most people don't get an opportunity to see. And Agnes is also going to um, look at all the different elements of the project, the external photogrammetry, the interior and animals, and, and show how they were drawn together into a single uh, recorded model. So just for a little bit of background, I wanted to say that uh, uh, there has been a massive expansion of 3D uh, data recording in the cultural heritage sector, particularly through museum digitization programs, but also through archaeological and historic site uh, recording. This has been done for uh, management purposes, building information modeling in particular is uh, very useful for management and conservation, but it's also been undertaken by uh, community groups and there is quite a lot of work being under, undertaken where uh, there's community engagement through particularly low cost approaches like photogrammetry. The traditional activities and audiences are essentially the records are being created for expert reuse, for damage and erosion monitoring, management of the buildings, some aspects of research and analysis are undertaken using the 3D records, as well as things like recontextualization where a site uh, is not necessarily in its original landscape context. 3D recording and representation is a way of actually recontextualizing it. But our focus in stage two of this project was really to look at uh, visitors and tourism and education. So trying to create a, a, a model that told a story and that hopefully should be uh, more apparent as time goes on. So I, with regards to photogrammetry as a recording technique, I just wanted to make the point that this, is, this works on multiple scales. What we have here is a, a, a photogrammetric image of a very tiny two millimeter wide Iron Age uh, glass bead modeled by a PhD student here at uh, uh, at the GSE. Um, and also uh, there's a standing stone, so multi-scalar, and here's an example uh, of a fairly large building, in this case one we should all recognise as being the, the, the Tobuth uh, steeple. Um, and this slide's intended to give us an idea of how, a very brief overview really, of how photogrammetry as a recording technique works. And it's essentially about gathering together as wide a range as possible of photographs from multiple different angles, giving you complete overlapping co uh, coverage of the, the site or monument. And we can see down here in the middle image, these little blue squares actually represent camera positions. So the software from these multiple images is able to extract the location of the camera in three dimensional space. And this results in what's known as a point cloud, which we'll refer to again later, which is geometric points uh, in space, uh, uh, located exactly where they would be in relation to each other uh, uh, with regards to a structure. The point cloud can subsequently be what's known as rendered, but essentially what we're saying is we create a surface and we color that surface or texture that surface based on those photographs. Uh, and there's one of the final products from the Tolbooth. And I, I just want to make this observation is that those photographs, as you can see, are all taken from ground level. So we look at this model of the Tolbooth, we can see that the model begins to break down in, in software uh, up near the top. So there's a very close relationship between coverage and quality of your photographs and the resulting model. The other technique which was de deployed uh, was laser scanning, which works, for those of you who are not aware of this technique, it works in a very similar principle to radar, where a radio wave is sent out and the echo uh, is used to locate an object and give distance to an object. LiDAR works in a very similar principle, except it uses light via a laser beam. So a laser beam is fired off and the reflection back from the laser beam gives you range and position. Uh, and it can do this up to a million points a minute. So you can, get, you can generate very, very dense point clouds. So this is work being undertaken a few years ago at Proven Hall. And there's a, 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 what looks like a coloured image of Crawford Hall in the garden, but actually that image is generated entirely from points uh, derived from the, from the laser scan. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, my colleague James, who's going to give us a brief rundown on 
the, the background to uh, Mercury Crosses in particular and the uh, uh, famous one that we recorded in Glasgow. Hi there folks, um, so I'm just going to give a brief uh, background on Mercury's Crosses in general and then a bit more detail on the Glasgow one in particular. So the first mention of American Cross in Scotland is um, in the reign of King William the Lion, so that's sometime between 1165 and 1214. They, begin, they seem to have began as uh, communal gathering places for markets, uh, um, but developed into a more prominent uh, meeting uh, space and focal point of the town, where uh, royal proclamations would be read, town celebrations took place, and uh, even executions were carried out. So they became uh, very important social and political monuments for everyday life well into the 17th century in Scotland. So here we have got a couple of examples. So uh, on the top left, uh, we have Preston Pans, which is the oldest complete surviving uh, Mercury Cross in Scotland. It's a very fine example of the, the unicorn on the top there. Um, in terms of uh, town celebrations, in the, in the bottom right, um, I'm not sure how many people watching will be um, familiar with the uh, Kirkwall Bar game, which is played um, in Kirkwall and Orkney every Christmas and New Year's Day. But you can see on the left, uh, left image in the bottom right, there's a small Mercury Cross there, uh, fulfilling um, what would be uh, what would have used to have been quite a common um, function uh, for everyday life in uh, in Scotland. Uh, royal proclamations, as I said, were also carried out from these crosses. So on the bottom left, you have um, a royal proclamation being read at the Edinburgh Mercury Cross and um, it's still done to this day for general elections and for the accession of a new monarch. To begin with, um, they were not would likely not as elaborate as the examples we see here. Um, many of them would have simply been wooden posts driven into the ground in the centre of a town so people knew where they were. Um, although some, such as that, an example at Inverkeething, uh, were used as primitive sundials as well. Since, um, since the Reformation in Scotland in 1560, they have not actually, uh, despite the name, been a, a cruciform style. The one here in Turriff is, is an exception to that. Uh, more often than not, they feature the unicorn, the uh, national animal of Scotland, at the top of the uh, uh, shaft, uh, or sometimes the town heraldry or, or a lion. Um, some interesting examples here we have, is, this is um, the top right is Linlithgow, which is not so much a cross, it's actually a functioning fountain. Uh, rather than a, a, a cross. Um, and a lot of them did start to disappear in the 18th century uh, with the increase in um, wheeled carts uh, being used in the centre of town. So, for example, the bottom centre image um, is a plaque in Hoyk, uh, which um, refers to the Mercury Cross there that was removed. Um, but since then, some have been uh, restored, such as the one here in Stirling, which um, was taken down, um, but was then put back up in 1891. So moving on to Glasgow Cross itself, um, with the development of uh, Glasgow um, from the 9th century, um, uh, right up through the Industrial Revolution, um, the area around um, where the four, four uh, streets around Glasgow Cross meet there, which are the Trongate, High Street, Salt Market, and the Gallow Gate. Um, that, that is the, the old centre of Glasgow, um, where the old Mercury Cross uh, would have stood. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it would have been the site of proclamations and markets. In Glasgow, this would have been prominently a, a fish market and, and uh, some executions. It was removed in 1659, uh, and the last mention of it in use was in 1649 when Charles, uh, King Charles II was proclaimed King of Scots uh, there following his father's execution. The close proximity of the market around the cross, the important religious uh, site at Glasgow Cathedral just up the road in High Street and the nearby brewery at the Dry Gate would have made the area a hive of activity, um, particularly in the 16th and early 17th centuries. So looking at the cross that was installed uh, in 1930, um, so it was designed uh, by this lady, Edith Burnett Hughes, who was given the commission in 1927. So Edith uh, Burnett Hughes um, was a, an architect. Uh, in her youth, she traveled uh, extensively in Europe and traveled, um, studied for some time at the Sorbonne. Uh, but she received her diploma in architecture from Gray School of Art in Aberdeen in 1914. Um, in 1920, she became Britain's first practicing female architect when she founded her own firm. And aside from the American Cross in Glasgow, some of her uh, prominent works in, 
they include the Cope Bridge War Memorial, seen here, which was completed in 1924, and the font at St. Mary's Episcopal Cathedral in Glasgow. The construction of the Glasgow Cross she designed, which is the one that is there today, was completed in 1930 and was opened in a ceremony on the 24th of April that year before the City Council and Lord Lyon, King of Arms. The design of the cross that is there today um, unfortunately can't take any reference from the original cross lost in 1659 as there is absolutely no reference uh, as to what that may have looked like. It's quite a similar style to the one seen in Edinburgh, it's slightly less grandiose. It has the traditional unicorn at the top of the shaft which bears the Royal Arms of Scotland. Uh, as a large octagonal base with quite a lot of space inside. Uh, the outside of, of, the, of the base features the royal motto of Scotland, along with um, the Glasgow court, coat of arms. And inside, there is a wooden staircase leading to the roof, uh, adorned with various carved wooden animals. Now I'll just pass on to Perry. Right. Oh, there we go. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen with you um, and take you through our storyboarding process um, for the project just to lay out what our original plan was for this. Um, so obviously this was significantly curtailed by the closure of GSA and the pandemic um, but this is sort of what we were originally planning on doing. So the sort of plan was to create an interactive visualization of Glasgow Market Cross um, in which you could investigate the cross um, and stuff like that using data assets created that we were gonna uh, create from um, data gathering exercises which my colleagues will go into. Um, basically we were gonna have access to the data from the exterior, interior and uh, the animal models which are inside the cross and we were also gonna have access um, for data from Govan Old Parish uh, and what we basically wanted to do was create this kind of um, hypothetical the sort of basically fully developed one branch of what would be a hypothetically larger project about connecting um meeting places across glasgow and using the sort of convergence of key roads around um the market cross such as trongate gallagate high street salt market um as this kind of central point and essentially you would use the Market Cross to sort of navigate to different parts of the city and then you could investigate the Market Cross itself. Um, so in our original plan you also went to Govan so you could navigate from there so we had this whole idea that you could travel across the river. Um, that's not something that I'm going to go into detail today but that was part of our original plan and then you would also be able to in, in a hypothetical, better, further developed version of this project, you would be able to go to um, like the cathedral and stuff like that as well. So one thing that we wanted to make a, a use of with this was maps. It was a really rich resource of historic maps available from the National Library. Um, so basically what we want to do is that you start out, sort of pulled out, um, and then you're looking down at a map from 1922 onto the River, uh, onto the River Clyde and you have Govan and the Market Cross marked. Uh, the start sequence would have involved um, you basically click start and then you zoom down into the map um, towards the cross and then you have a kind of quite dynamic sequence where you the camera circles up and around the model and then you settle up on the unicorn at the top of the cross. Um, we wanted to use the unicorn as a sort of rotating pointer so basically we um, identified the four streets that we were going to be facing. So Trongate, Salt Market, High Street and Gallagate. And what you would basically do was the unicorn would point to each of these. Um, so for instance, if I pointed, if I rotated and I pointed the unicorn towards um, the High Street, you'd have kind of ecclesiastical uh, sounds like bells, if you pointed to, towards the salt market, which was also going to be the way that you accessed Govan, um, you would have, as there were, were originally executions down at the salt market, you'd have sounds associated with that. We wanted to have kind of market noises, so sort of, sort of populating the space with this kind of um, menagerie of sounds, if you will. Um, and if you clicked on the unicorn itself, you would be able to then go inside the cross and have a look around in there. Um, 
so you would essentially click on the unicorn and you'd have a little animation where the camera zoomed around to the door of the cross and then you'd be able to go inside. Um, and because this is something, this is really a sort of hidden history of Glasgow, people aren't really familiar with the architect and they're not very familiar with the person who designed the animals either. Um, so we wanted to sort of emphasize that this is really a sort of hidden histories scenario. So we wanted to really bring out the opportunity to investigate these things. So we have this plan that you'd be able to sort of rotate around the interior and then you'd be able to like click on the animals and you get a little bit of information about the architect and why the cross and how the cross was designed and stuff like that. Um, just as a final thing for the sequence where we were hypothetically going to travel to Govan, uh, what we would do is that you would be up at the unicorn, you could select to go to the salt market and then we would you would have this sequence where you sort of headed down the street and then zoomed back out and then traveled down the Clyde and we were going to phase through to different um, historic maps progressing back in time um, until you get to Govan Old Parish and I won't go into any more great detail about that um, but I will pass on to Lizzie who's going to tell us a bit more about data collection. Hi there, um, my name is Lizzie and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the how the exterior uh, model was created and as you can see on the the, the right there and um, that's that's the finished um, model that I created um, but it it took a series of, of different sort of um, processes to actually get it to look like that um, so first of all there was the data captured during the field work um, sorry if we just move on to the, um, captured as part of the field work um, we decided to use uh, photogrammetry as a process which um, Stuart told you a little bit about earlier on um, to capture the exterior in 3D um, and really kind of the octagonal shape and its relatively compact size um, kind of made it quite good for data capture. We were just able to kind of go around the entire uh, building itself and take photos. Um, it's really kind of important to make sure there's a little bit of overlap between the photos so you can stitch it together. Um, and around 350 photos were taken to make the model. Um, so on to the next slide. Um, the process of, of creating um, the photo model um, was done in Agisoft Metashape. Um, but the, because we didn't really capture enough um, photos from sort of a higher up angle of, of the balustrade and the roof, you can see that it came out quite kind of distorted in, in the finished photogrammetric model. Um, so really it needed, it needed to be processed and sort of remodeled a bit in Sketch um, through DS Max. Um, so I imported it into 3ds Max and removed the polygons that were distorted, as you can see, kind of highlighted in the red there, and just kind of cleaned it up for, to prepare it for some remodeling. Um, and in the next slide, you can see this process of, of kind of modeling from scratch. You've got the, the railing and the sort of the little pillars there. Um, and because these weren't um, created from the photo model, I had to, to take some, well, I had to select some photos to, to sort of texture, to kind of create the material of the, the balustrade. Um, and um, as our photos from, from the actual um, balustrade was, wasn't actually, they weren't good enough to kind of map that exact texture on onto these pillars, I took a sort of generic um, picture of a close-up part of the market cross and kind of and put that on to those pillars to sort of make it look natural. Uh, you can see in the top right-hand side, um, I chose one which wasn't quite didn't quite work. Um, it was a little bit too light, so it was kind of a bit problem-solving to kind of work out which look the most accurate and yes so that's me that was um the process in creating the exterior and i'm going to hand over to grant to tell you a bit about the interior hello 
So um, because our plans changed quite last minute and we were now modeling the whole thing, um, it became my job to um, kind of build the model up kind of freehand uh, and trace the point cloud that was generated through all the different laser scans that we'd stitched together of the interior. Uh, and you can see that in the uh, pictures on your uh, left, how I was able to isolate different areas of it and trace, for example, on the picture on the bottom there, starting with the steps, just make a box, slightly deform that box to the shape of the, uh, the step and then build it up uh, one step at a time. Um, it was a, a time consuming process, if not all that difficult. Although now, if you go to the next slide, um, uh, I will talk about the complications that arose despite um, it being, I, despite my saying that it wasn't that difficult. So um, I say there the, the density of the point cloud, uh, the top right picture there shows that um, there were tw uh, 23 and a half million points that were stitched together from various sources. Um, and of that, my computer was only capable of showing six and a half million points. So that made it quite difficult to, um, even though I was able to hide uh, parts of the point cloud that I didn't want to look at, um, it's quite difficult to look at different parts of it and kind of pick out the shapes and um, especially in the fine detail. For example, in the ceiling, you see in the bottom uh, left picture there, um, the, the kind of the arches or the, the beams that are, they're not support beams, but that's kind of what they look like, connecting the, the lights and the pillars. Um, it was quite difficult to look in there and kind of figure out and wrap my mind around the 3D space and how to create, recreate that shape within that 3D space given the tools at hand. Um, Probably the best example of this in the top left picture is the, the X's that you see in the those nice, beautiful curved wooden X's you see in the um, banister. Um, creating smooth wooden shapes like that is actually quite difficult. So it became my job to figure out how to uh, recreate that. And I, it was effectively just tracing 2D lines over a 3D space, which is, um, that doesn't always line up quite easily. But I, I did get there in the end. And then we, so we get into, um, I can show you if you go to the next slide, uh, kind of a finished dish product where you can see that I had to uh, um, isolate different um, area sections and shapes and kind of build up from there, connecting them together, kind of creates an almost a, a fun house look. But then we also get into questions of accuracy. And uh, as mentioned earlier, so the point cloud isn't perfect. If you move to the next slide, the point, the point cloud isn't perfectly uh, lined up. I, as I said, there's probably four or five different scans of the interior that were stitched together, along with another four or five scans of the outside with two or three scans of the roof. Um, as they get stitched together in, in another program, there's kind of there's gaps between the spaces where um, it, it didn't quite line up properly. There's also gaps in the point cloud where the laser scanner was because it can't scan uh, what the laser can't hit because the, the laser is only going in a straight line. So there's massive gaps on the walls underneath the, uh, underneath the stairs as well as underneath right where the scanner was. So they kind of created uh, the necessity for almost guesswork as to what um, where things would end and I had to try and with the best educated guess uh, where to put the shapes. Then there's also a great degree of human error that was going into this because again, this is freehand and I'm tracing this um, on dots that are really hard to make out when you get right up close to them. So you can see here the, the column doesn't really line up perfectly uh, with the, the ceiling and the, 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 the uh, so it doesn't line up perfectly with the ceiling, but it also didn't line up perfectly with the door where the plaque was and the plaque facing the door. So I had to make the, um, uh, had to take the initiative and uh, sacrifice accuracy where the, uh, the column is lining up for the door or for where the column is lining up for the ceiling and have the, the plaque facing uh, straight on uh, to the door as you look in. So then uh, the next slide. 
uh, here, uh, texturing, as um, was mentioned earlier by Lizzie, it's kind of the process of adding kind of colors and the illusion of depth and shadows uh, to the to surfaces. And there were some, uh, because we couldn't get access back, and normally what would be preferred is to go back and take nice high quality straight on photographs of all the surfaces and then map those onto the model that I created that couldn't be done. Probably the biggest regret of this is the nice floral design that you see on the left there of the, on the top of the column and above that, it's a bit harder to read, but there's also some wonderful uh, dragon interlakes there as well that normally would have been mapped on with photographs, which had to unfortunately be left blank. So I just sacrificed all of that to create kind of this drab gray room and just textured um, the, uh, the windows and the light fixtures, which would create a more natural lighting effect if we decided to set this up in such a way. So then the next slide, uh, here you see kind of the finished product as I was done with it. The only um, model in there outside of the, the interior is the, the plaque on the front of the column. And that's just kind of showing you um, my finished product there. So now on to uh, Agnes with the other photogrammetry models and the animals. Thanks, Grant. So I will talk to you about the animals inside. Uh, as you can see, there are four of them. This is a dog, a cat, a hare, and an owl in the back there. And these were um, modeled by Margaret Cross Primrose Finley who uh, was a modeler and sculptor, and she also actually studied at uh, GSA, so alumni. And uh, this is one of actually the reasons why the Market Cross building itself is, is really interesting because of this collaboration between a woman architect and a woman uh, sculptor who created not only the animals, but the unicorn on top of the column outside. Um, so the technique we used for capturing the animals was again photogrammetry and if we just go into the next slide, yes, uh, there is a challenge with these because um, while the outside was fairly easy to capture because it is just a much more robust building, these statues are very detailed as you can see and they're incredibly shiny which is a problem for uh, photogrammetry because as these images are processed inside the software, uh, it really relies on uh, identifying the same um, same um, parts of of different images, and when a surface is shiny, it's really it can't really do that that well. So to kind of uh, do something with this, we use talcum powder to make them less shiny, and this worked in uh, most of the cases actually. If we go into the next slide the owl was the most successful model we had. As you can see, we still lost some of the detail, but you can really read the features of it well. And you can see the carving around the eye, for example, and the, and, uh, the talons on the bottom there. It's really readable and visible. And uh, I will show you later, actually, the backside of the owl. There was um, kind of surface um, damage done to you. Uh, the very top uh, part um, of the sculpture and that was really captured well as well. And then if you go to the next slide, you can see that this didn't exactly happen the same way in all cases. Of course, uh, the owl and the other uh, two statues uh, also had to be manually um, cleaned up because um, software alone doesn't really produce uh, usable models that you can just uh, straight away use for whatever you want. But as you can see the bunny here, uh, we really had a bad case of, of uh, completely melted face. And what I ended up doing to kind of um, mitigate this was uh, essentially sculpting uh, part of its head by hand inside a blender, which is a free uh, 3D modeling software. If someone is interested in trying this out for themselves, getting into 3D modeling at all. I really recommend using Blender. It is a free software and really easy to get into. So what, um, obviously when, when this happened to this um, hair, it didn't only mean that um, the 
the detail was lost. We also didn't really get a usable texture to put on it. So I ended up putting just a generic wooden texture to kind of imitate that same surface finish that the other statues had. This is not really successful, I wouldn't say, but it kind of at least um, doesn't uh, leave it a completely blank model. Then if we go into the next one, yeah, you can see the other two. Again, these are less detailed than the owl, but you can still see the features came out really nicely. The uh, ears of the cat are a bit scrunchy, but it's still very readable overall. And again, this was uh, modeled by Perry, actually, the remaining three statues. Uh, so that's her work here. Um, yeah, if we go into the next one, actually, what I finally did to kind of uh, a way to present all this together, um, inside Blender again, uh, I put all these different, um, different models, the model of the exterior, the interior, and the statues together into a kind of a navigable model, which I'm going to show you now in action. And hopefully you can see that better. So I hope that works. We have the outside here, and this is completely um, very nicely done by Lizzie. And then we can go inside and take a look at the inside. It's quite hard to navigate properly, so I'm sorry if it clips and you can see something very well. But as you see, there's the plague, there's uh, the overall architecture is modeled by Grant, and then really nice lighting setup, and the statues themselves. There was um, a degree of uh, inaccuracy again with the placement of the statues as well, because of course, even though we did our best to, to recreate this interior, there was um, some degree of inaccuracy to begin with. And for example, if you look at the shapes of these pillars, they don't really match the shape of the animals, the base of the animals, which should align, but again, human error and otherwise error. Oops, sorry. Then we can scroll up here to the bunny and the owl. And I'll show you the kind of surface damage I was talking about earlier. If I can rotate it, sorry. So here on the back, that's fairly visible. And you can see we try to recreate the shininess as well. It doesn't really um, give the same effect back, but um, just to give you an idea of, of what they look like in real life. Yes, that's sort of market cross done. And again, in a better world, we would have had time to develop this into something and use it for something. And of course, the top part with the unicorn would have been modeled, but we didn't have time and resources to completely finish that. So I'll just give it back to everyone else as well, I think. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Agnes. That's great. If everybody could uh, switch their, their cameras back on, I think we've got some time now, uh, maybe 15 minutes or so for uh, a question and answer session. Uh, if we have questions, I'm just going to check and see if our, our audience uh, are uh, coming up with some questions. We'd be very happy to, to answer. I, I just, while that's happening, uh, I, I was just struck by the, uh, well, two things. One is, like the, the the interesting irony that we had with those animals, where actually recording the animals using photogrammetric techniques, as you pointed out, Agnes, and I think we all were quite familiar with this by the end of it, very difficult when they're shiny in the way they were. So there's highly reflexive, as you see, you take a photograph and what you actually end up with, our brain knows it's a reflection, but what the photograph sees is a kind of uh, a white space, in essence. Left on the uh, left on the um, the image, which makes it impossible. So we go through this process of finding every way we can to reduce the shininess of the object in order to record it photogrammetrically. And then when you incorporate it back into the model with the object, you have to find a way of making it look shiny again. 
it's a kind of circuit, it's a kind of circular process trying to find that texture that rep represents, so we make it as, as little shiny as we possibly can, and then ultimately we try and get it to uh, back to its shininess. I think that's kind of where that scientific thing kind of comes in, like the accuracy versus the sort of aesthetically making sense. Because um, Agnes was kind of bringing up the the angles of the um, banister, and it's like we we wanted it to look good as well as you know as being slightly accurate and whatever. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, exactly. Grant Grant, Grant talked about that uh, 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 a lot, and actually, it's really interesting. How difficult it is to do that the, 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 for those uh, of the attendees who maybe are interested in uh, building recording and building conservation there's a there's obviously the technology of building information modeling is you know kind of been uh, um, coming to the fore right now and it's brought in its wake the idea of historic building information modeling where you can use these quite sophisticated three-dimensional recording questions um, to uh, um, uh, we, sorry, these recorded these recording and management applications to represent the building, uh, historic buildings. But the, the real lesson of HBIM historic building information modeling over the last few years is that no two elements in historic buildings are the same. So I think Grant, I'm right in saying that when you were modeling the the, um, the inside banister, that you couldn't just model a single arch sweep oh yeah um i i tried that and copying and pasting it but uh having to deform one of those arches to every other one kind of changed the model and deformed it too much beyond the point where it was recognizably what it was supposed to be so i had to do it um kind of um independently for each one Okay, we, we have a question in from, from uh, uh, Finna Sinclair who's asking us, I, I don't know who wants to tackle this one, but it was, it's about the unicorn. Has, has the unicorn been rendered yet? So. Uh, well, there's a lot of no. data capture <laughs> issues with the unicorn. Um, so unless you, Very have high up. <laughs> unless you have access to a drone, uh, which would be great, and that's going to be quite tricky to capture that unicorn very well. Um, so I don't really know what we can do. We, we did try to get, um, well, we got, we captured it in the laser scan data um, because we did laser scans. Um, James and Mike did a lot of laser scans of the exterior of, of the building. And they did manage to, by going across the road, manage to get the top of the, the pillar and the unicorn. But just with the, like, obviously laser scan data is accurate, but you're not going to get this, this quite the same accuracy as we achieved with the you know the close-up photogrammetric modeling of the animals inside so whilst it was there it wasn't it wasn't detailed enough to to render it so. yeah as i think grant mentioned that um, actually the point cloud for the inside was really dense but we had the opposite problem for the unicorn because it was simply not uh, there wasn't enough information to really model it in the same way as, as he did for the interior just can't quite get the angles angles right because you're you're always coming at it from from below so you're never going to get the side on angles or the top down top down angles when you laser scan um is, is the problem there so you could render something but it's, it's mm, i doubt the quality would be amazing yes i think i think unfortunately the unicorn was a victim of covid we the, the, there's this normal process where uh, you, and this is part of what we're learning in the, in the heritage visualization masters is how you plan about how you plan you go ahead you plan you make your you make your kind of itinerary and what you're going to record and how you're going to record and as part of the learning process we learn inevitably in almost every situation that there's elements that are missed and that require people to go back i know i know grant was very uh, keen to go back and get textures one of the things we would have gone back to do is uh, is actually get better images of the um, uh, the unicorn, but I, I also think that um, the laser scan was probably the best we were going to get it without using some other technology, like for example a cherry picker to go up and get close up uh, closer photographs. Uh, potentially, we could have done something with a telephoto lens. We can't fly a drone at that part of the city, so the unicorn turned out to be 
slightly problematic for us, which was uh, unexpected, I have to say. I, I, while we're on that, I'd just like to mention that uh, there's, a, there's a film uh, actually featuring our questioner, Kuna Sinclair, uh, about the market cross, and that's going to be released on Thursday uh, as well as part of the, the Doors Open Day. So that's, uh, that's something to... I wonder if Fiona's going to talk about the unicorn. So I've got I've got a question as well, which I'd like to ask uh, round table. I think I think I know what Grant's response to it is, but I'd be interested in, in knowing what other people's responses were. And it is to do with the fact that that due to unavoidable circumstances, even, even though we had all this good data set and we were able to to model the individual elements, the outside, the inside, the animals, and bring it together, there was obviously greater ambition for that stage two project. I was just wondering if, if people were willing to share with us uh, what they would most like to have seen happen that actually gets stimmied. I mean, I, I was I was really keen to have um, the sort of soundscapey elements around the market cross because I think it's it's a lovely kind of point to feature on because we had such a diverse range of different things, topics going on, depending on which, uh, which direction you were looking in. And we had this idea that, you know, at, as you look down one road, you, yeah, you were hearing a specific soundscape kind of relating to a specific time period and sort of topic that we were covering in that. Um, and, you know, not only is there all the sort of sounds of, of these different features, there's the sounds of the kind of the cross itself because there's the there's the the tron the tron tron gate no it's the tall booth steeple yeah. um there's the bells and that and it, it used to be a sort of place where um people celebrated hogmanay and stuff like that so there's lots of lots of activities going on there that would have been really cool to represent through sound yeah i think within the context of what we've done for this, um, it would have been nice to go back and um, have some really nice high quality textures to be able to create. But um, for what we were gonna originally do, I would have liked, we had this plan with, with historic maps to kind of uh, illustrate the transition from the Market Cross to all the other sites that we were planning on um, incorporating or incorporating for you know planned future development or what have you. And, um, it would have been nice to even try to like tie in the style of that map within the modeling style of the area. So that's, it's, it's unfortunate that probably that last bit probably would have been too ambitious, even for the previous product project, but it would have been nice to at least think about and yeah, um, I, have I, possible. Sorry. Um, no, I thought there was a lot of, um, potential yeah, going on from what Grant was saying with, for, um, to look at the the heritage and history from a slightly different angle uh, to what is maybe traditional in Glasgow, and maybe highlight this connection to Govan um, in particular, which we did a lot of work at, yeah. um, which which is maybe not not so well known. I think this would have been a great opportunity to showcase that, um, but sadly sadly couldn't be done. Yeah, yeah, I think it was certainly really interesting because uh, we spoke to Stephen Driscoll um, when we went down to Govan for some research. Um, and basically Govan used to be the former ecclesiastical centre and then it really moved up to the, where the cathedral is now and sort of showing that that relationship was certainly something that I think was really interesting that we unfortunately weren't really able to do. But yeah, that would have been an opportunity that I would have liked to expand on quite a bit. Yeah, I think overall the most lacking aspect of, aspect of this is some sort of context of sorts. So sound, just visual. I think they had plans to include some laser scan data of just the surrounding landscape. Exactly. That would have been really nice to to kind of actually make sense of this where it is and why it's important, you know, in just this placement within the city. So yeah. Well, I, I I'm really glad. I really like all those answers because because it kind of reinforces reinforces the point. One of the things we focus on, or we focused on over the last year, is this idea of the the, the audiences and the purpose and why we're doing these things. And actually, one of the things we ended up not being able to do in stage two was exactly this point about revealing this richer context and this untold story that uh, uh, that James mentioned there, uh, which was 
really nicely developed through our conversations with uh, Professor Driscoll up at, uh, at GU. I, I'd also like to say from my perspective, uh, where I was sitting in on uh, the planning conversations, the, the, this team for this project were, 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 I think, highly imaginative and highly creative. So there's aspects of this, I think, stylistically, I would like to have seen developed. I think we just did, we just could not do because of the way things had had planned out, uh, which is one of the reasons I was very keen that we, we had um, Perry storyboards come in uh, for this presentation, just to, to let people know that the project itself uh, had not only richer stories, but a richer style. So there's a, there's a couple of other questions that have come through that we've got time for. The first one is, is somebody who's, who's very kindly thanking us for us and, and wondering about the, the recording of this session. The, the plans, as far as I know, are for the session is being recorded uh, and hopefully it will be posted up on the, the Basel Building Preservation Trust Doors Open Day uh, website, so it should be available for future use. I think um, also on you. the Facebook event, I think. Sorry? Maybe, I think on their Facebook page as well. Oh, sorry, thank you. For, so it's modern technology. So uh, there's a there's a there's uh, finally a couple of uh, final we probably get time for both these questions um, and this this is a really relevant one to given given what we were just discussing there and it, it is asking how we imagine the experience being used it says um, it could be a platform on, on smartphones for example would it have been possible for people to use it on the spot so like place-based uh, engaging them with America across there and then and actually doing the journey along the cloud to, to govern or were we imagining it as a, as a kind of screen-based uh, 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 output for people who are not in Glasgow? And I know this, this, this speaks directly to your research, your current research grant, doesn't it, about place-based mm -hmm. versus uh, remote experiences? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, um, this project itself might, um, as, as it was originally planned, would probably be a bit too clunky for something like on, for use on site and would probably be better um, deployed uh, via the internet for consumption kind of at home because there's just there's a lot that was originally intended to go into it and the, the sites it's a very crowded site usually there's a lot of people around so it'd be hard to work it into some kind of like augmented reality smartphone mm -hmm. kind of interaction it certainly can be things that, I mean, in a different project, we could still use a lot of what we did in a sort of locative style um, app, which, you know, that could be interesting. I think the information and the research that we put into this would make it more um, suitable for like an on-screen at-home experience, just so you can really understand the depth of information that we were revealing um but there definitely could be another iteration which would suit an on-site experience i think especially because this is a closed building and you can't really get inside it would be really interesting to have a, an augmented reality version where you can just kind of hold up your phone and see inside where you're standing right there but yeah that could be a really simple version of that yeah i, I think that was one of one of the very first things that came out of the of the conversation when we realized that we weren't going to be able to um fulfill the project the way we did, we'd intended and we had to find some other way of, uh, uh, of, uh, of reacting to it. One of the ideas that came up was the idea that, that um, you could be on the ground, so it was place-based and locked in, but even, you couldn't even get inside the building, but as Agnes says, that, that using augmented reality, you use your device as a kind of portal. So all the recording we'd done inside or the modeling that got it done and the recording of the animals and so on, that would become visible while you were there, even though you couldn't go inside the building. And actually, technically, that's not, that's, that's not that difficult to achieve now. And it, and it feeds into um, what I think is probably going to be our um, uh, uh, well, final, final two questions here, um, which are really about the, uh, uh, the technologies. About the, one is about advancing technologies um, and uh, what, what we can foresee about these things becoming easier and easier over the years. And, and I'll just answer that if that's, if that's all right, uh, uh, briefly, by, by saying that if um, the, the historical trajectory that we have seen over the last 40 years continues, then the answer is yes. 
is that the, these uh, technologies become much easier to use and much more amenable for, for example, uh, the, the, one of the questions uh, waiting here uh, relates to um, uh, S5 and 6 school pupils. Absolutely, these technologies would be usable by these school pupils. We've already deployed photogrammetry with them. Um, uh, community groups and it really changes people's relationship by changing their relationship to the recording technologies it really changes the relationship to the historic environment so what, one of the things is not just to to show off what wonderful technologies we've got is to think about how we, we can use this technologies uh, as professionals as students as community groups and how it changes our relationships to the to the to the uh, monuments themselves so the, the final the final question we've got a couple of minutes for, um, and it'll be it'll be interesting to hear your responses to this. Um, it, it's from Chris Lewis. It says he's starting this project with S five six school pupils. Uh, they'll be attempting some basic photogrammetry of historic buildings, which is great. And he's just wondering what top tip, what piece of advice would you give them about the process? Bring Tom uh, come there. <laughs> Don't, don't be afraid to screw up the first time and have to go back and collect more data. Yeah, you're always going to have to go back. Um, Which was our problem. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I, well, I think that, that is a, that's a standard thing. From my, from my perspective, the top tip I would give, and this is, um, it's actually, it's a very practical one, but it's very easy to fulfill in, in Glasgow, is um, in, in for a dull overcast day that, that casts flat shadows. So but not we, rainy. It, uh, not not raining. But dull <laughs> over Slightly <day>. harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So the, the, avoiding the sunshine not so difficult in Glasgow. Avoiding the rain slightly harder. So you want that that sweet spot spot in between, where uh, you're not having extreme shadows cast, and that fundamentally that is uh, uh, really to do with capturing shadows. We talk a lot about um, the rendering, uh, so finding textures to render onto the model. If, if there's bright sunshine, what you'll find is that you get a lot of shadows cast, and those shadows cast uh, end up being baked into the model, and you have to kind of retroactively deal with that. So, bad weather. I would play about with the um, the settings on the um, on this whatever software you choose to use because they can um, get sur surprising results. <laughs> so you, you, even if you you render something at low quality, sometimes it comes out better than high. So I wouldn't always assume that the settings are best. It is. I, I'm afraid we're we're running out. We're running out of time. I know we're under strict instructions to finish uh, uh, appropriately on time. Thank you to everybody who's submitted uh, questions, and also people who've submitted some uh, very nice comments. I'd just like to thank uh, my colleagues and ex-students for doing a, a very good job, and I particularly like to. I know I've already done this. Uh, but I'd particularly like to reiterate the fact that in very difficult circumstances this year, this cohort have responded uh, astonishingly well. Uh, and I've, uh, no, no, you have, you've done it, you've done a great job. Uh, and I'm very, I'm very proud of the lot of you. And thank you very much indeed for uh, your participation in the seminar. And I'll, I'll speak to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we should all give ourselves a round of applause if we go through the... Uh... Give ourselves a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> no, I <thought> <laughs> Thank you very much to everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>